My father's father, my grandfather Mosher, was quite a man. He was, in a sense, a prototype of a perfect heartland mid-American. He was certainly a wasp. He was a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, all right. He prided himself that our family had two ancestors, two antecedents who had come over on the Mayflower itself in 1620. These men were named Francis Cook and Richard Warren, and they were signers, according to granddad, of the Mayflower Pact, whatever that was. But the real star of our family, the one granddad was proudest of, was a man who lived in Ohio in the 1850s on a farm with his wife, Ruth, his name was Stephen Mosher. He was not only descended from these two men who had sailed across on the Mayflower, he and his wife in Mount Gilead, Ohio, had run a stop on the Underground Railway in 1853, for sure. That was a time when part of the family moved on further west from Ohio to eastern Iowa which is where Granddad was born. He came from Quaker stock. So did my grandmother. They did not really pass the Quaker credo on down to the next generation. I wondered sometimes if maybe they were a little embarrassed by the idea of pacifism. Granddad had been in a form of ROTC when he was in college, officer training cadet training. He'd had a uniform, and he had been taught to do what he called setting up exercises, morning exercises, which he said were good for him all his life in maintaining an erect posture where he wasn't slumped over like young men of the mid-20th century who had poor posture. He had good posture and he could still wear his cadet's uniform when he was 95 years old or so. He was quite a statistician, Granddad. He loved statistics. He loved to study statistics. He worked with Henry Wallace, part of the great Wallace agricultural family who ran an agricultural newspaper that was read by farmers all over the country. Of these Wallaces, the one who became most famous was Henry Wallace, who was agriculture secretary under FDR, and then he was vice president under FDR for a while, although he was replaced by Harry Truman, and Harry Truman was the one who, of course, succeeded Roosevelt. Henry Wallace and granddad, this same Henry Wallace, worked together on developing certain kinds of hybrid corn back in the early 20th century. They were trying to help small farmers, family farmers, earn a better living, have crops that could survive, and seeds that would be strong enough not to fail the farmers the way many seeds had before. Granddad was such a statistician that when it came to figuring out various statistical remedies for things, a normal slide rule which people today aren't so familiar with, an object yay big that would dangle from engineers' pockets. At the grad school in Cornell, when I was a kid, I could see these graduate students walking along with slide rules dangling from their pant loop or their belt. It was about a foot long and an inch and a half wide, and it had a, a part in the middle that slid so you could compute various, I don't know, logarithms and things. I was never very handy with a slide rule, but Granddad Mosher had been. He had been such a whiz with a slide rule that this normal slide rule, only a foot long, was inadequate for what he needed. He needed not three decimal points, but 
who knows how many decimal points of exactitude in things that he was figuring out. And so he devised perhaps the biggest slide rule in all of North America, perhaps in the entire world, the entire globe, this slide rule Grandad Mosier made for himself. He contrived to take a big Conestoga wagon wheel, which was perfect for him because he was of pioneer stock and he prided himself that these people who had moved out to Iowa from Ohio had come on big wagons and they had been among the pioneers when there weren't roads west, just rough trails. He'd taken a wagon wheel, huge high wagon wheel, cut it down the middle somehow, and figured the numbers to go around both wheels so he could spin one one way, one the other way, and he could get figures going out to an unbelievable degree of exactitude. Because his slide rule, in effect, was something like 22 feet long. He didn't mess around, Granddad Mosher. He was living in Urbana, Illinois, when he made this slide rule. But later on, he and his wife, Elva, would live out their years for their last 35 years in Granddad's case, somewhat less, maybe 25 years in his wife's case, at a place called the Mayflower Home in Grinnell, Iowa. I think it was no accident that Granddad landed on this place, the Mayflower Home, to live his sunset years. He was very proud of having descended from Mayflower passengers. Granddad was born in 1882, and he died in 1982. It would have been lovely if he had made it to his 100th birthday, but he fell just six weeks shy of it. A month and a half before his 100th birthday, he died at the age of 99.9 in the Mayflower home in Grinnell, Iowa. He had had the habit when he and his wife had driven around the 48 lower states in the continental USA on long trips, usually in black Buicks, that every 50 miles by the odometer on the car, he would stop, get out of the car, look around, and take a photograph of the nearest farmhouse. Sometimes he'd have to drive maybe a little further to get to the nearest farmhouse. But whichever it was, the nearest farmhouse, Granddad, M. L. Mosier, Martin Luther Mosier, because he wasn't messing around with his name either. He was of good, upright, Protestant stock. You can't have a name any more Protestant than Martin Luther, whatever. Martin Luther King, Martin Luther Mosier, good Reformation names. M. L. Mosier would stop and take a photo of the nearest farmhouse, and then he would cross-index the location of this house with the kinds of lumber or brick material, building materials in that area, the kind of soil that farm offered. If it was a farmhouse, it usually was a farmhouse. More statistics. One time he saw this patch of dandelions outside the Mayflower home when he was 80, 90, 95 years old, it got him very curious about why dandelions grew in particular clusters here but not there. With string, he marked off quadrants in the lawn and he compared one patch to another. He took soil samples. He did all kinds of stuff because he had a never-ending curiosity, this man. He seemed kind of dull to some of us grandchildren. But later on, when I got to reading these things he had compiled, finally I realized what a very rich life he had led. He sent us all copies of books he had compiled when he was 96 years old. He sent us what he called the Brown Book. It had a brown wood-like 
plastic cover, and it was filled with incidents from his life growing up in the pioneer Midwest. They were very interesting stories. They made their own soap. They'd made their own toys. He and his brother Arthur, for whom my father was named, very self-sufficient. And so later on, as a grown man, he'd made himself a slide rule of matchless dimensions so that he could go out to places, mathematically speaking, no other man had ventured before. That was Granddad Mosher. As a child, I have to confess, I found Granddad's interest in statistics and in taking photographs of a farmhouse every 50 miles kind of curious. I wasn't that impressed with these projects of his. And hybrid corn was beyond my understanding at that point. It was a bit abstract for my mind. But what caught my interest, what I really admired, was his woodworking. He was a very fine carpenter, granddad. He made a set of checkerboards when he was probably in his 70s or early 80s, made of laminated pieces of different kinds of wood for the alternating dark and light squares on the checkerboard surface, and then there was a margin around it that was very attractive. He made one for each of his five children and one for himself, so he made six of these checkerboards. But my favorite part of it was the chamber on the inside, deep in the body of the checkerboard, where you would store the checkers. The entry hole for the checkers to slide down inside the board was regulated by three little turning knobs. They were a combination lock so that you could get the checkers in or lock them in. You had to know the secret. Granddad liked that kind of secret access sort of thing. His sense of humor insofar as he had one that I could discern as a child, was expressed through these little tricks and hiding places. He came and visited us in Ithaca when we were building our house at 118 North Sunset Drive in the summer of 1956, when I was seven years old. And he made it his project during his visit to make each of us, and there were six of us in our family, a clothes dresser, a big, bulky, full-size dresser for each of us, made of birch wood. Again, not the most attractive kind of wood, not an ornamental sort of wood, not fashionable, but practical. And it had big drawers that would pull out and push in easily. And for each of the male members of the family, of which... I was one, there were four of us. Mom and Ann were the two females, but each of us boys and dad got a dresser that had a tie rack in the middle. So our drawers were a little narrower than the drawers for the women, but we had a place to store all our ties, which I had maybe one at that point. But it gave me some ambition to uh, get more than one tie in the future. When did I wear a tie? I'm not sure. When I went to church, I suppose, our lugubrious Presbyterian church in downtown Ithaca. Church going was important to Granddad. So he built us those dressers. And that didn't really ignite my imagination either. But later on, I found these oval picture frames that he had made. Again, out of laminated pieces of wood, he was very skilled at using Elmer's glue, white Elmer's wood glue, and clamps. He was a master of Elmer's glue and clamping. He used that, I'm sure, on the checkerboard, which probably didn't have much in the way of any metal attachments, maybe none. The other thing that I really admired was the desk he made. 
he made this big, oblong, high, rectangular, square desk that had a fold-down desk on each side, one for his wife on one side and one for him on the other side. But my favorite part was a hinged, it was like a piano hinge, at not the corner of the piece, but but in maybe two feet from the upper corner at one end. And this big panel would flop back and it would expose, running right down the middle of this big desk, his circular slide rule made from this wagon wheel cut in half. That too was hidden, this circular slide rule. So he could pull a chair around to the end of the desk when he needed to do some exact figuring going out 18 decimal points or whatever he did. The other thing that was secret in this desk was access to some little hidey drawers. There were lots of drawers and nooks in the desk for storing things. And a few of them were locked. They weren't locked with key locks. The key was a mechanical connection over at some other disguised part of the desk. You had to know where this little pin was that you would pull out and that would activate some rod inside that in turn would pull another lever and give you access to opening and closing it. He wasn't what you would have called a mischievous person, but he had a few mischievous factors in these things that he built. And I did admire that as a kid. He was quite a man, and I wish I had thought during my 20s while he was still alive, during my 30s while he was still alive, to spend time with him at the Mayflower home where he lived in Grinnell, Iowa, and to hear the stories that he had to tell. But I didn't. I should have. I didn't. I read them now in his brown book, and I thank him for writing them down. It was very thoughtful of him. Thank you.